So, um, yeah, I want to give you um, a quick overview about the work package uh, identity and trust uh, and for what it is um, yeah, designed. So um, the main purpose of the entire work package was to solve the, the problem between um, the different federations within GIX. So that means the main a main goal was to to um, yeah, find a solution to to make authorization and authentication between federations possible without GDPR um, uh, rule violation. So it means uh, when we have different federations and we want to log in another federation, then we cannot simply copy and paste the users. We cannot exchange all the time identities <clears throat> between all federations. So therefore, um, yeah, we designed a solution on SSI basis to come far away from this central authority solution in the direction of a decentralized um, yeah, solution. So uh, in the future, we will go more strictly in the direction of, of FCS of solutions. Uh, in the moment, we, we started with the common SSI solutions that we have to um, yeah, solve the problems uh, within the GXFS system. So um, how does it work? So in a rough overview, we have this triangle of trust. I hope the most of you know it already. So we have on the one side issuer, we have a verifier, and we have a participant or a holder. It means <clears throat> the issuer issues to the holder um, credentials. The credentials are presented uh, later on uh, to the verifier, and the verifier can prove it and can decide later on if the issuer was trustworthy or not. So that is that what we have currently um, yeah, in the direction of the trust framework or with the trusted services API what we have designed it for. Um, yeah. To, to establish exactly this triangle of trust to yeah, realize um, the SSI um, uh, concept. So what we have designed for it was <clears throat> to realize this triangle of trust was in, uh, in the end of the day some, uh, some components which uh, help to, to realize it. So that means we have for the older, for example, the person, personal credential manager, we have for the organizations um, an organizational credential manager that is more on the verifier side, but it can be as well on the issuer side. We have entrusted services API, which should support in um, yeah in making automated decisions for the verification or for the issuing. And we have um, also some services around it for authentication and authorization to enable existing identity systems to join the system. And we have as well notarization services, which are able to um, yeah, to 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 issue credentials on the basis of any kind of paper-based um, proofs, so to speak. So, for example, when you have uh, some ISOs on on paper, or when you have any kind of certificates on paper, you can use this notarization service later on to prove that you have this paper really and that the paper belongs to you. And then the yeah, notarization service can issue for you and and digital credentials, so to speak. That you can participate in the system and we provide as well in this two stack and, and, and manager and personal credential manager as, as wallet app to yeah present it so that's for the for the holder mainly for the personal uh, also for the natural person so to speak so you can install it on the tablet on your smartphone uh, or on other devices um, which supporting android or ios um, to present credentials and to receive it from from the issuing authorities Behind it is a registry. We don't currently provide the registry because the registry is currently um, yeah, um, up to the use case. So we can have ID Union here, we can have software networks here, we can have custom indie networks here. It's currently yeah, up to the use case what has to be used. We support as well the web. So it means when uh, you don't need any kind of um, yeah, any kind of indie based network then uh, did web is also possible and yeah the toolbox allows it so far also to integrate other things um yeah so far it's necessary so the components itself uh, as i said is um yeah uh, at first the uh, authentication authorization services that is for the moment uh, an attribute based um ssi broker which can be integrated into keycloak it's based on open id connect protocol and yeah, we have here uh, some some basic features uh, at the end of the day, which are OpenID Connect compliant and so on. So, and how this was look, uh, how this looks like, have we here in the demo? So I can quickly start the demo to, to show this uh, how this looks like. So um, at the end, um, yeah, we also in this demo we go to 
uh, any demo page. So the, the guy here starts a demo uh, web application and the demo web application will request an authentication. So that is here a key cloak and the key cloak has integrated the IDP with showing a QR code. And when you scan now the QR code with your mobile device, you can present the credential and then later on you're logged in on the web page. So this is currently just an, an Hello World application. So he shows here that, that he has access now to the to the to the web page and now he's changing the resources. So that uh, to demonstrate that when you change the resources in the background, that that the authentication is again requested for different credentials to get different scopes. So that is not that much magic. It's at the end of the day an open ID, yeah, open ID connect protocol which allows you to integrate it in the web page uh, and use it uh, as usual uh, as you know it from Keycloak or as you know it from from other systems like uh, Microsoft Active Director or things like that. So um, it's not that much magic. You can integrate it in Keycloak on other providers. Um, at the end of the day, it's OpenID Connect compliant. So um, let's go to the next page. So that means the authentication authorization services have uh, an OpenID Connect compliant broker, so we can integrate it into services as already mentioned. We have some in introduced some new MyD Connect flows. We have introduced um, a dynamic client registration for some use cases where it's necessary to register dynamic clients. Um, this is quite new because in the past the dynamic client registration was a manual process. Now is it an automated process, so that means you can use the authentication processes to um, pick up automatically um, initial, initial access tokens and things like that to register your client by yourself. So what can we do with all this uh, with this component and with all these features from this component? So yeah, we can integrate in other OpenID systems. We can uh, use it uh, in combination with the policy systems or different wallet things. So it means when the authorization component is replaced in the background, uh, for example, OCM is replaced in the background by any other thing like IPFS or whatever, then uh, you have similar functionality, but with different login uh, QR codes. So it means when you replace the QR code by anything else, then yeah, then you can log in with this. So that is not necess necessarily bound to in the technology. So you can, for example, create your custom QR codes over the TTSA integration or over any other integration. And then you can use this OpenID Connect provider for other login purposes as well. So um, the next component was the personal credential manager. It's mostly just an SSI wallet app for Android and iOS to presenting verified credentials. So that means um, the main purpose of this component is presenting the credentials uh, is currently just uh, supporting the Indie network technology. So it means ID Union software and other Indie networks, but it bases on the Hyperledger ARIAS protocols. So that means uh, it's use it's using DITCOM and um, other um, yeah ARIAS RFCs, which are defined by the working groups there. So, um, but it's yeah planned in the moment that we uh, that we enhance this this PCM maybe in the future with other protocols. For the moment, is it just uh, Hyperledger um, ARIAS based? So it means we have a mediator behind it. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have ID Union compatibility and all the things, so we can receive uh, credentials as well from there, and others uh, will follow in the in the next months. So. What can we do with it? So normally you can use it just out of the box to um, yeah, present your credentials, uh, as already mentioned. So we can enhance this in the future, maybe by using, um, yeah, for example, for, for mobile searches, for any kind of COM4 functions. So it means when any federation uh, has, for example, COM4 functions or uh, already existing apps, so the functionality can be integrated or a functionality can be enhanced. So it's just an open source basement for it to, to go forward with, with the entire thing and to have a basic tool set which can be enhanced or derived uh, in other apps and whatever uh, is necessary for the use cases. How it works uh, is shown later together with the OCM. And then you get a small impression how, how it um, yeah, looks like. So the OCM itself is also in wallet, but more for organizations. So it can be hosted in the cloud. So um, it's in service, in a backend service, so to speak. So um, when any kind of uh, organization wants to issue something to another organization, then the OCM talks to another OCM. So that means at the end of the day, the OCM is representing the company or the service or any kind of machine, uh, depending on the use case. So that means you can issue directly to this um, OCM and credential um, depending on the use case. 
That means when you issue the credentials, the OCM is later on able to present it automatically. So it means when one organization says to the other organization, give me a credential for this and this uh, type, then the OCM is able to present it. So, but he's also able to issuing something. So he's um, yeah, um, foreseen for, for issuing participant credentials, for issuing principal credentials and things like this, but based on any technology. So that means uh, there is an any credential definition necessary, which is linked to the credential. There's also the location list on the, uh, the location list on the Indian network. So that means uh, we can support, for example, now the UN software and the other Indian networks, as already mentioned with the PCM and so on. It supports the basic um, RSRC, and yeah, we um, we uh, tried to generate here a very high modular structure to have maximum flexibility. So um, later on, it could be enhanced with other protocols. We can um, yeah make middlewares out of it, etc. So depending on the use case, so we have to cross check then uh, this one and then later specs uh, how we enhance it. So at the end of the day, it's a generic protocol, so it's compatible with the notarization API, also with the Akapai agents and so on. So because they are all speaking the right, the same, the same protocol, the same RES RC, so everything is fine. And the OCM can as well replace later on when you have other use cases, other tools. So it's not necessarily um, needed to use this for issuing. So it's just in good basement to, to start with staging. So how this um, looks like is here as well somewhere, but yeah, let's discuss uh, at first uh, the other features, what we can do with it. So that means we have uh, at the moment uh, the possibility to, to use this as a service. So we can use that as organizational wallet. We can um, yeah use that automatically together with the TSA. We can use um, the OCM with manual processes if necessary. So it means when any kind of Credential is requested, so we can yeah, set up manual processes on it in the federation if necessary. We can use this per service or per, per um, whatever um, organization. It's also possible to use an OCM for virtual organizations like projects and things like this. So um, it, it depends completely on what's necessary. At the end of the day, he is issuing a credential type, and the credential type has to be anchored on the ledger to yeah to to issue the right the right thing. So, um, yeah, but it can be replaced by the business partner agent if necessary. So it means when the issuing is not not rich enough or any kind of thing is not not has not the, the, the highest flexibility, it can be replaced so far the um, RS RFCs are the right one. So that should be not the problem then. So and how this looks like for one example do you see here in the demo. So just as preparation, we will see um, in the demo on the left side in Microsoft Visual Studio and on the right side, uh, the PCM application. And the guy here will, um, so to speak, issue and credential and will import it in the um, PCM application. So, and this looks like this. So we simply execute in the postman and route uh, with some uh, variables. Um, then he is uh, generating in the background, as it OCM is generating in the background and QR code. And then I can take the app and can import it. So it means when he scans these things here, then uh, we can accept it into the wallet. That is that what the guy here is doing. So he accepts the credential. There is a uh, an connection established. And after a while, um, he is receiving the credential uh, and the credential is then offered to him. So he can look on it. He sees then, OK, what is the email address? What is my EMP first name and things like this? And if this is correct, we can accept it and it's generated and imported in the PCM. So and then when it's done, you can present it later on to, to a website. Uh, yeah, for example, to our demo application or to our um, yeah, other um, integration of the authorization, for example. Yeah, so you can this, you can try out this already. So we have a demo application when you have the PCM installed. You can um, use this integration exactly. You can import it in the PCM, you can present it, and then you see how the login works. Um, how these things here are, um, uh, so to speak, visualized later on is up to the Federation. So it means when the Federation says, hey, we make just a small intranet web page, then you can do it in this way. When you say, OK, we send this QR code by email, why not uh, send it out by email? It depends completely on the use case. So um, how this uh, credential or how this um, credential or this QR code is generated, you can send it as well as, as notification to the smartphone directly, et cetera, et cetera. So it depends absolutely on the use case, what, what, is, what is necessary and whatnot. 
So um, let's go to the next page. That is the Trusted Services API. Um, the Trusted Services API is the biggest service in the entire um, machinery, so to speak. So that means uh, it collects a lot of services which are necessary to, to make automated decisions about um, credentials, about uh, any kind of conditions, et cetera, et cetera. It's based on the open policy agent and the open policy agent was modified with some uh, enhancements. So that means the Rego language allows it to enhance the entire functionality with, with, um, yeah, with package extensions. So that means the package extensions provide currently the functionality for the DIT resolving, for the for the signing, for the verification, and then all the all the other features. So that means the policy execution itself was enhanced uh, with with this um, with this OCM functionality. So we have a package extension as well for the OCM functionality. We have, as I said, already DIT resolvers signing verification services in it. We integrate it into the policy execution task controllers that you can execute parallel task and an asynchronous task, uh, which is currently um, in the yeah, policy agents not, not possible. We have uh, integrated external input interfaces where you can feed the, the entire trusted services API from outside with additional content. For example, when you have an SAP system or whatever with, with Salesforce, Salesforce system with price lists, then you can push the price list into the cache of the TSA and the policy will pick it up and then you can bring out uh, the price lists automatically to the to the um, yeah service definitions that you have provided to others. So you can also generate content with it. So for example, self descriptions. So it means you can say, okay, uh, I provide this, this and this. Um, here's the content, uh, any JSON content, what you like is, is generatable. And at the end of the day, you can control everything over GitOps. So it means uh, when you have GitLab, GitHub, whatever, you can check in that the policy system will pick it up and check it out. And then uh, when it's synchronized, uh, the policy is directly executed. So I mean, that is that what we show in the next demo. So it means uh, you see here, for example, on the left side in Visual Studio or any kind of code editor on the right side, the postman. And what will happen now is that the guy is generating a policy and he will execute the policy in the right side. So it means when a policy is generated, a new HTTP API is automatically um, generated. So when I generate an example policy, I have on the right side an uh, example policy and I can execute it directly. So, and this is that what the guy is now doing here. So he will generate uh, a new directory, gives it a new version. Um, that means I have then an URL called uh, example policy slash one dot two, etc. So that means it's working. And then I can yeah, create here a Rego policy, which is then executable. On the right side, uh, the link is blurred, but uh, you have for each policy that you generate and separate URL, uh, what can you execute immediately after the generation of the policy? So he generates here a simple trustless check, means um, he generates uh, a simple policy which says, okay, um, the issuer comes from the input that is on. Um, the, the message on the right side, so to speak. And then uh, he checks if the issuer is in a trust list, what he defines later on in a data file. So that means data uh, data dot trust list is at the end of the day, the trust list within the, the static um, data JSON. In the future, you can also use the trust list from any kind of trust framework or from any kind of API call in the background. Yeah, it depends or from the external cache input. Yeah, it depends on that, what, what, it, what, what is necessary. So, and now he's generating uh, for example, the, um, the the static data file. So that is, so to speak, the policy bundle. Uh, so we call it policy bundle. So you can <clears throat> a policy bundle can contain data JSONs and policies. So a policy rig on a data JSON file per version. And here is currently trustless in it. Can be a different thing. You can put your IP addresses in it and all, all um, different uh, static data that you have. It's yeah, up to the <clears throat> to the policy what is necessary. So here is it currently a list of dits, of example dits. So in the example dits are here checked if the issuer is um, in this list uh, available. So now he checks everything in the Git system. So it means he commits it simply as you know it from, from the most uh, Git systems. So um, he does it in the console. Yeah, normally it's here and there easier, but yeah, he does it in this way. So after the commitment, uh, the route is then very quick available on the right side. So he pushes it. So and now 
is it already um, done on the right side? So now he's going to the, to the right side and checks the entire thing. <clears throat> so that means now is he puts the issuer in it and now he tries it out uh, with simple example and the feedback is false because yeah, no, it's not existing on the trust list. So now he's using another one um, which is on the trust list and everything is then fine. And then you get the true back. So that means whatever you want to see uh, from the policy execution, you can define it over policy bundles, uh, for example, for trust framework or any other thing. It, it, it doesn't matter what it is. At the end of the day, you put in JSON in and it comes in JSON out uh, and the rest is um, some some execution in the, in the middle. So the next thing is um, when we have now this fancy policy execution and this, this, this rich enhancement over the policy packages, we can, uh, yeah, of course, create fancy things here to simulate, for example, um, did webs. And this is that what we tried out with the policy system. We tried out what happens when we generate a policy uh, and when we fill in the policy together with, with the signing keys that we have any in any kind of vault. In this case, it's the HashiCorp vault. So we have a key set in the HashiCorp vault. We generated a key set there of signing keys. We integrated, uh, yeah, for example, um, the extension for the HashiCorp vault. And when we have this extension available, we can generate you know, things like did web as a service. So that means we can simply say, okay, I take a DID, put uh, a verification method array into this JSON, what we have, put some context uh, stuff into it. And then we have already a valid uh, W3C um, yeah, context uh, file or uh, did document file, so to speak. So and this the document is then resolvable over the dynamic URLs that we have generated. So means when uh, I have pushed the policy, I have the document available for resolving. So and this is that what he's doing here. He simply says, okay, the issuer DID is a pre-configured one. So let's take this. Uh, we have the verification methods. Let's take all the keys from the world. Let's put some some context stuff into it, what we have prepared. So we simply put that into the policy, hard coded because it's just a one time action for a moment. So and then we push the entire thing uh, as before because it's just a policy, nothing else. And then um, when he has pushed it, then we use it on the right side in the DIT resolver, which is an external DIT resolver from uh, the DIT foundation. So that means let's push that stuff here. So and now um, we are able to resolve the entire did there because it reflects, for example, the um, the DID of the current uh, web page. So and he puts it in, and uh, as you see it, uh, he will resolve it now. And um, when he is resolving it, he gets the did document out. So that means. With the policy system, you can uh, generate the webs over policy check-ins without uh, the need to set up uh, yeah, web servers, without the need to set up any manual controlling. You can simply push that out of, of uh, a vault and uh, yeah, and a police and a policy. What is yeah here and there some advantage for some for some uh, yeah use cases. So and when we have the vault, then we can do also signings. So that's the next use case. So we uh, he shows you simply how it yeah how something can be signed. So that means we have any kind of data array. In this case contract ID and a company. And uh, when he um, yeah presses the button of the URL of the signing service in the TSA, he has um, yeah and signed verified presentation out of it, which is yeah helpful for some services. So it's the standard, uh, it's the standard verified presentation. So you can generate it now here. So you see it as a verified uh, presentation later on it and approve. So and the verifiable credential contains simply the content that he has uh, sent before. So and when the entire stuff is, um, yeah, later on, uh, yeah, used for the verification, then uh, yeah, you can send the entire content to the verification endpoint. And yeah, then you get the feedback if everything is correct or not. So that is that what uh, he is doing here. He verifies now. And you see that uh, when he is modifying later on the content, that uh, it switches them back from, from true to false. <clears throat> so currently is everything okay? But when he changes, for example, the company name, 
then um, yeah, it's not more valid because the signature is broken. So that is the classic um, yeah, signing and then verification principle together with an uh, with an vault in the background. OK, so um, yeah, what can we do with the trusted services? So we have here a wide range of functionality. So that means we can use the policy execution for generating um, yeah, content. We can use it for using it, for example, for DitWeb as a service. We can inject content to, to use um, it for yeah, any kind of decision making in the background. And over the GitOps, you can integrate it very smooth in the most, uh, the most systems. Uh, and you can exchange between um, yeah, the federations, for example, everything over GitOps. So it means when there is a maintained trust list in any Git uh, repository, you can main, you can exchange the trust list to, to all the others in the federation. And when they pick it up uh, in the trusted web services API, everything is then directly um, running um, yeah, according to this trust list, what you have to find, which is very helpful when you have internal Git systems, for example, um, yeah, for projects or whatever, then you can align this uh, directly on it. Yeah, so that means um, there is a wide range of functionality, what you can use for every use case. Um, yeah, what kind of, of fancy use cases are solvable with it? Will we see that in the future when the people uh, have learned uh, how to use it? So the notarization service is the loss component. So that is currently just made for compliance for requesting verified credentials and digitizing them into um, yeah, existing analog, uh, analog credentials means we have here mostly an evidence-based issuing flow. So that means the main difference uh, to the OCM is it to um, have a compliance part, a big compliance part behind it. So it's uh, the, the, for example, the OCM is more made for, uh, here's a credential type, give me a credential and everything is fine. And here is it uh, more an evidence-based. So I want to issue a credential, then there is a session opened, and then the session can be filled with evidence documents, and the evidence documents can be checked by operator on the background, and when everything is fine, then the um, credential can be released. So that means here's more the focus on the compliance things and, and on manual interaction and so on and so on, but the Indian network support is still the same, so the, the credentials which are popping out at the end of the day are compatible with the other protocols. So. And we have enhanced it also with compliance things like the digital designer service. So it means when someone is uploading an, uh, yeah, an evidence document and the evidence document signatures are checked against the digital signer service. So you see if the qualified electronic signature is correct, correctly made, or if the uh, signature on it is, is broken and things like this. And we have also um, OIDC based identifications in it that, that just uh, the right operators can can um, issue something and that the requester is identified correctly. And this one can be uh, yeah, enhanced later on by EID and things like this. So and this is this is at the end of the day that what, what is possible with this component so the OpenID Connect can be used for integrating EID, integrating SSI itself, depending on that. So we can use in the background any kind of anchoring uh, for the facts, uh, yeah, depending completely on the on the federation, so the notarization can be also used for establishing a special kind of anchoring within the federation. So when the notarization API is used, for example, to to identify members of a federation or identifying members of a project or whatever, then uh, yeah, you can uh, issue them special credentials. You can establish evidence flows for it and things like this. So at the end of the day, it's it's made for trust anchoring and and uh, yeah for yeah so to speak and kind of um, yeah evidence flow based issuing and what you do with it uh, depends at the end of the day of the use uh, on the use case. So the code can you find here? So when you want when you have interest in the, the GitLab code or when you want to see the the videos, um, you can scan the QR codes 